What's up, everybody? My name is Kwa, and welcome to another Live Talk COVID-19 series. Uh, I'm here representing the U.S. Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce and serving as the, the president for the Northeast region. Today, we have a very, very um, important topic to cover. Um, and it's not an application, but it is about uh, cash flow. And to me, personally, it's one of the most important attributes uh, to run a business and to, un to, to fully understand. But I'm not gonna be the one talking about it. I'm bringing on two experts over here that's, uh, that's gonna make me, uh, well, I'm gonna be a student today. So, but before we start, we're gonna, well, I wanna remind everybody that to make sure you go to youtube.com uh, slash TV and subscribe. Uh, we're streaming on Facebook, we're streaming on YouTube, we're streaming on Twitter. And make sure you go into uh, uh, uspac.com and th they're putting up the latest uh, resources up there to help small businesses as well. So with that, let's get started. So with us, I'm bringing on Tim Fulton and Bill McDermott. Tim Fulton is the president of Small Business Matters, Vicious Chair of Emeritus, and CEO and executive coach. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge, by the way. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, Bill McDermott, the profitability coach of McDermott Financial Solutions. So I'm gonna be stepping back, and Tim is gonna be moderating this session over here, and I'll be back for the Q&A. So Tim, take it away. Thank you, Quan, and thank you. I won't really want to thank USPAC. They're doing a great job of keeping their members informed in a, in a time where you know, information is so vital to small business. And I want to, Bill, great to have you with us today. I'm so pleased that you could join us. Uh, Bill McDermott, is, as Quan said, is, is, his brand is the profitability coach. He helps small businesses figure out how to become more profitable, and I thought, with his experience, uh, he would really lend itself well to this this topic of, of short-term cash flow and how do we manage cash flow. So, Bill, let's start uh, with an, maybe a uh, an easy question. It seems like why is cash flow management so important during this crisis for small businesses? Yeah, that's a great question. And first, Tim, thank you so much for having me on, and thank you to our host for uh, uh, this great show and a. In an economic uncertain time, probably the first thing I would say is just remember that your, uh, your receivables are somebody else's payables. And so generally when things turn down, uh, money is going to start flowing slower, uh, which means that your uh, receivables, you're not gonna collect as fast. And somebody is also gonna be trying to collect your payables faster. So the combination of potentially a decline in revenue, because I think there are some businesses that are experiencing a uh, decline in revenue right now, the combination of less revenue coming in, uh, attempting to pay your receivable, or excuse me, pay your payables a little slower, uh, and you're attempting to collect receivables a little faster, that creates cash flow problems. Hmm. Well, and Bill, I know you work with quite a few small businesses uh, and m many of them I know are growth companies. What are some of the most common mistakes that you see these companies make in terms of managing cash flow? Where, where do they go wrong? Yeah, that's, that's really a great question. I think first, uh, any company that's growing, growth always requires cash, Tim, always. And so your receivables are building. Uh, cash flow usually uh, declines uh, because you have less cash because more of your money is sitting in receivables. Mm -hmm. And so to offset some of that cash flow uh, challenge, a lot of people are looking towards a, a line of credit uh, in order to find uh, that cash to supplement what they're not collecting in their, uh, in their accounts receivable. Mm. Yeah. And uh, thinking about collections. So I'm a small business owner. I know I've got to speed up my collections somehow during this crisis. What are some strategies that you would suggest to me as a small business owner to try to accelerate my collection efforts? Yeah, I think uh, probably the first thing is, is understanding uh, how you're collecting now and certainly tracking 
uh, the number of days worth of sales that you have in accounts receivable. So uh, recently I was talking to a psychology practice. Uh, they rely on insurance providers to, uh, to help them, uh, you know, with their reimbursements on, on patients. And what we found in this particular psychology practice is about a third of their accounts receivable were actually sitting in over 90 days. Mm -hmm. So there was some low hanging fruit. Uh, there was actually in this particular case about $50,000 uh, where if someone was willing to get on the phone, uh, walk those uh, reimbursements through, get checks issued and, and received, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is one way that I would say to accelerate collections is just look for the low hanging fruit. Uh, secondly, uh, if you're accustomed to collecting by cash or credit card, uh, sometimes consider using electronic means like ACH. Uh, ACH is a, is a much quicker way to get paid than using collections through just regular U.S. mail. And so those would be two things that I would do is first, look at what receivables do I have that are beyond terms. Uh, and then second, look at some alter alternative electronic means of collections like ACH. Wow, that's, that's great advice. So I want to speed up my collection efforts. The other side of the equation are, is, are, is money going out of the company. Is, is it appropriate for me to, to reach out to my vendors to see if I can maybe slow down my payments? How would I go about doing that? Yeah, and uh, certainly all of us are wanting to be sure that we're keeping our credit rating good. And so uh, credit rating implies paying within terms. Um, certainly this could be a time, and I wouldn't say this often, but uh, if you're taking uh, discounts for early pay, there's some uh, businesses that will offer a 2% discount for a net 10 days uh, in order to conserve cash right now and, and help with cash flow, you may not want to take those discounts. So that would be number one. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I always advise my clients pay within terms, uh, but I do have some clients when an invoice uh, for a payable comes in the door, they just feel compelled to immediately send it right out. And if it's net 30, uh, it doesn't have to be paid in five days. It can be paid in, uh, you know, uh, if you send it out on the 26th or 27th day, knowing that it will get there in time for net 30, even if it does go one or two days beyond the, the net 30 terms, uh, that's certainly an option. The other thing is go to your vendors. If you've got a good relationship with them, ask them, hey, can I pay in net 45? And, uh, you know, the worst they can say is no. But if you don't ask, you don't get, right? <laughs> and Bill, I'm also finding that more and more vendors, particularly in the B2B space, are taking credit cards for, for vendor payments. Is that another strategy? It seems like that would maybe give me another 30 days if I, if I can pay by credit card. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good point to raise. You know, you are paying a, a merchant processing fee. Uh, so you have to be aware that it's uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 3%. However, having said that, taking credit cards is, is certainly an alternative uh, to use credit uh, to pay invoices versus actually uh, writing a check. Sure. Okay. So we want to accelerate our collections. We want to maybe try to slow down our, our uh, out, outbound cash. Let's turn our attention. That's, that's the balance sheet. Let's turn our attention now to the, the profit loss statement, particularly on the expense side. I know you spend a lot of time helping companies explore ways of cutting their overhead, cutting their operating expenses. So uh, give us some examples there. What are some expenses that you find sometimes that are maybe easier to cut than others for small business? Yeah, that's, you know, that's actually a great question. So I was talking to a client this morning. They're a, uh, uh, they're a well-known retail establishment. They're in the fourth ward here in Atlanta. Uh, they've certainly been impacted and uh, the next thing for them uh, beyond people cost is rent. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that they're talking to their landlord about is say, hey, can I have a, uh, can I have a deferral uh, on my rent payments for the next 90 days? So certainly while that's not an expense control item per se, it is a way to gain cash flow because if you can defer some of those rent expenses, that can help. Um, I think during a recession, there are 
what I'm going to call good expenses and not so good expenses. I'm not sure there's such a thing as a bad expense, but one thing I would say is looking at your uh, looking at your operating expenses with the idea: Can I find one percent of my operating expenses that is maybe non-essential to driving revenue? Mm-hmm. And so if I'm looking at those uh, and let's say my my annual uh, operating expenses, let's say it's three hundred thousand dollars. Well, can I find three thousand dollars somewhere really insignificant amount? And then can I find another one percent and maybe go through three or four iterations of that until you really feel like you've got some of the non-essential operating expenses down? And you're really operating on really what are core revenue generating expenses. Mm-hmm. But that would be a way that I would say on the PL, uh, look at your expenses, find those 1% uh, decreases that you can make, uh, and then execute on those. Yeah, those are great ideas. And, and Bill, just as another example, I was talking to a client, same thing, kind of going through the, the operating expenses. Uh, and they found they had multiple CRM subscriptions and they, they weren't, weren't a lot of money, but it's interesting. I think, you know, when we actually go down and look at the details of those expenses, I'm sure, as you said, that there's, there's opportunities there that we may not have looked at otherwise. And now's a great time to be looking to, to cut, cut expenses. The, yeah. Bill, as the, as the profitability coach, I know you've got a, a, a bag of tools that you, use with your clients and because i've seen some of those tools in terms of cash management what are some examples of, of tools maybe that you use with your clients that might help some of our listeners yeah absolutely and before i answer that let me just kind of share back to the earlier point uh so in the uh since the last recession uh 10 years ago so times were good you know, I wasn't watching as much as, uh, as I should be as far as what I eat. Uh, so probably over the last years, I, I, I put on 20 pounds. And so all of a sudden, I got a little fat. My belt, you know, was a little tight. And so what did I do? The last uh, three months, I've actually shed 25 pounds. Hmm. And so what I've where I'm going with this is over the last 10 years, I'm going to bet a lot of our listeners have allowed their businesses to get a little bit fat. Sure. And so let's find the fat, let's trim the fat and, uh, and basically get back to the, to the lean, mean fighting machine that they are. Now the tools, uh, I'm a big believer first in key performance indicators. Uh, and I'm a big believer in scorecards. And so a couple of the things that I will tell you that I track and, and for anyone in the listening audience, uh, I'm certainly happy to try to share uh, some of those tools uh, if, if that's appropriate. Uh, but probably, you know, on the balance sheet, I'm always looking at how many days worth of uh, sales do I have in cash. Uh, this particular retail provider I was talking to this morning, actually, I was impressed. They have over 40 days worth of revenue in cash sitting in their balance sheet. Uh, I'm looking at uh, accounts receivable, their retail so that they don't have any, but I'm looking at have those receivables increased or decreased as far as number of days worth of sales and receivables. And uh, probably on the income statement, I'm certainly looking at gross and net profit margin. Uh, I'm also looking at leverage. How much debt do they have related to the total amount of equity? And is that changing? Because what happens is sometimes in a uh, uncertain economic time, we may be tempted to borrow money to fund losses. Mm -hmm. And so one of the traps uh, that I think a a business owner needs to be aware of in this situation is uh, when you're borrowing money to fund expenses that you don't have revenue to support, that's kind of like pouring gasoline on, an, on a fire. Debt is an accelerant. Mm-hmm. And so if the business is declining and you're borrowing money, you're actually pushing your break-even point up because it increases your interest expense. And so it, it's just uh, sometimes taking the path of least resistance, borrowing on your line of credit to fund that, uh, can come back to haunt a business owner later. 
So probably as far as the scorecard, uh, cash and receivables, number of days, watching your gross and net margin, and then also watching your leverage, total debt versus total equity. Great. Uh, Bill, I've got one more question for you, and then we're going to open it up to our listeners. I'm sure they've got sure. some questions. So talking about cash, and I know I've gotten this question before, and I'm not sure I've always given the best answer. I'm a small business owner, and I'm trying to figure out how much cash should I have available to the business at all times? How do I determine that that amount of cash that I want to make sure that I never drop below? How do I figure that out? Yes, uh, that's a great question. So I, I'm going to ask you, have you ever talked to a business owner that said they had too much cash? No, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, so um, admit. yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, I think I have worked with uh, with businesses that have as little as one week's day's worth of, of sales in cash. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the most I've seen is this particular business that I was talking about this morning that had 40 days. Um, I would say the average that I'm seeing in businesses right now in a normal economic period is probably somewhere in the 15 to 30 day range. Uh, I would say right now in dealing with an uncertain economic time, uh, I could see conserving cash and attempting to move the needle closer to the, the 30 day mark. Having one month's worth of sales in cash, uh, I think is, a, is an incredibly conservative approach. And if you're actually a business owner and this is the first recession that you've gone through, that really seems odd because 100% of your experience is really based on the last 10 years and it's been all, it's been all good. Uh, but for those of us that have been around the block uh, and this is our third or fourth recession, we just know that there are some fundamental things that we should be doing. Uh, and one of those is is really conserving cash. So I would say, you know, a, a month's worth of sales in cash actually would not be too much, Tim. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you 100 percent. And Bill, you know, it's it's interesting for now. It's been over a month. I've been prescribing to my clients that they, they want to be hoarding their cash. They want to be collecting cash. One, as you've uh, talked about, we never want to run out of cash because when a business runs out of cash, that's game over, you know, for, for any small business. And and the second reason I think is, is just as, as important, when we come out of this, which we will, yep. I want my clients to be buyers, which yeah. requires cash. Because, yep. you know, anytime we come out of a downswing in the economy, there are great opportunities for buyers buying equipment, buying inventory, with low, lower amounts than they were going into this, uh, buying talent. There's going to be a lot of people looking for work and we want to have cash to be able to acquire top talent, maybe even acquiring other businesses, because there will be businesses that will will get hit hard by this and may not recover. And so the value of those companies may be such that it may be uh, a, a good idea for small businesses to be looking to acquire businesses coming out of this this downturn. So we, we want to have as much cash as, as, as possible. So yeah, I think uh, to that point, so I was talking to a CEO of an engineering firm. They're a 50 person firm. Uh, they are very well positioned in terms of cash. But to your point, one of the things that I was talking with him about yesterday is there is some really, really good engineering talent uh, at at firms that maybe will not make it through this recession for one reason or another. So to your point, um, this is a great time uh, to anticipate the market. And I'm going to go back to something that you said earlier. Hoarding cash implies a little bit of fear and i know you didn't mean to say it that way but that's kind of what i thought about this there is tremendous opportunities that exist in a marketplace when we go through a downturn mm -hmm. and so positioning yourself to have a mindset of growth and opportunity instead of fear uh, i think is is really impactful this engineering ceo i was talking to said hey i'm looking for top talent if there are some people that I can uh, bring on the team uh, because of this economic downturn, I want to be positioned to do that. Great. Well, uh, Bill, I think this is a good time to turn it over to our listeners. Uh, I'm sure there's some questions out there. Let's do that. Sounds great. 
thank you everybody uh that that was really educational for sure and my comment is that when you talked about the expense of reduction and when i was trying to go through it that was the first thing i did i was looking at can i save a dollar anywhere i can and you know whether it's fifty dollars a hundred dollars you got to do it to save and another thing I, I you know i wanted to talk about is the um uh, uh line of credits i could tell you the line of credits saved my butt you know and you know for the cash flow purposes and just having cash at hand maybe you want to talk about that a little bit yeah bill that's a good good topic let's start with companies that have lines of credit how should they be managing those now and on the flip side if i don't have a line of credit is now a time to look into that yeah i would say uh generally speaking if you have a line of credit uh and your uh your business is is doing well with the exception of maybe what's going on in this current economic time i would certainly approach your bank and ask them to increase it uh, my rule of thumb is generally one month's worth of revenue or one month's worth of operating expenses as kind of a proxy for the amount of line of credit so for instance a three million dollar revenue com company should have about a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar line of credit um, if you don't have a line of credit, um, you've kind of heard the saying, best time to borrow money is when you don't need it. And so what I would encourage you to do is even if you don't need it right now, there may be a point in time, either in this economic cycle or in the next economic cycle when things start expanding, uh, that you may wanna have that, that line of credit in place. So again, uh, go ahead and put it in place, even if you don't need it. Uh, that way you have it uh, versus being in a crisis, having a cash call, maybe struggling to make payroll uh, and not have it. Great point. Um, so so you got a, quite a few questions. <laughs> um, okay. A lot of businesses have been laying off and furloughing their employees to save on expenses and help the employees benefit from unemployment. What else can they do? Uh, in a, aside from personnel? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Bill, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll take that one. So probably, uh, you know, next to, next to people costs, probably the next big expense they may have is, is rent. So part of at least a short-term fix would be attempting to, uh, defer rent payments. Uh, if a particular business has, uh, you know, non, non revenue generating expenses that the business owner deems non essential. Uh, now you might be uh, thinking, well, my goodness, what is that? So back to maybe uh, Tim's uh, explanation, let's say you have, uh, you have three different CRMs that maybe you're only using one and paying a subscription for all three. Uh, obviously, cancel the other two unless they're essential to your business. Um, but beyond, uh, beyond people cost, beyond rent cost, uh, one thing that may be appropriate to say at this point is if you have financing in place with a bank right now and you're making monthly payments on loans, interest payments on lines of credit, so actually, uh, if you have an SBA loan, uh, there is a current program out there right now that will either subsidize or defer, I believe up to six months worth of payments. Uh, if, it, if you have loans, but they're non SBA loans, but they're with a bank, I've heard that right now, most banks are willing to offer a deferral of at least three months worth of loan payments to help get through the economic crisis. So that might be, that's not a cut for expenses, but that's a way to at least defer expenses that maybe you don't have to pay. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, I think that, that you know what, to answer another question, uh, a question with Krishna, he had asked, uh, what do you do if you're facing difficulties and giving excuses not to pay? Um, you you kind of go into the, the moral standpoint and ethical business ethical standpoint. And I think you made a good suggestion that, yeah, you go to those programs, get some loans and, pay but you should be paying your vendors in my opinion but can you talk about that too 
Yeah, I think again, um, basically at this point, it's a it's a new economic environment that we're dealing with. You have built relationships uh, based on mutual trust and respect. You want to continue those relationships, uh, but probably both parties are having difficult times. Uh, probably the worst thing that you could do is not talk to each other. And so I would just encourage very open dialogues, uh, basically understanding both points of view, attempting to meet somewhere in the middle. Uh, generally, the best deal is cut is when both sides actually feel like they, leave a, they left a little money on the table. That's usually a good deal for the most part. So I would encourage that. Um, and so that would be what I would suggest, just uh, purely, you know, purely talking and working out a mutually agreeable resolution. Great. That, that's a great I, answer. If, if I could add on to that, if I might, you know, it's hard to imagine that anyone would have to go through more than one disaster, natural disaster in their lifetime. Uh, I was unfortunate enough to be in South Florida during Hurricane Andrew and owned a business that, that took a real bad hit. And something that I did that I think worked pretty well with my vendors is I went to each of my, my most significant vendors and I did two things. I showed them my financials. I said, okay, this is where we were. This is where we are today. And then I showed them where I thought we were going in the, in the future. So I had complete transparency with my vendors. And I felt as a result of that, I was able to, to ask for help from them and receive help from them that I might not have gotten otherwise, but it required me to be very open with them about what my plans were, where we were, and how we were gonna come out of it. And I, and I think they appreciated that, that openness and it certainly helped us quite a bit at, at the time. Yeah, I have another thought, maybe just from a planning and from a strategy standpoint that I think is important. If this is your first uh, recession that you're going through, what I would say to anyone in our audience, probably the most important thing that you could do right now is, is do a what if scenario and go ahead and plan for a 20% reduction in revenue for the remainder of the year. That is going to sound kind of severe to some. Some might say, hey, my business has been impacted more than that. But at least as a starting point, uh, let's say if a company is doing uh, $250,000 in monthly revenue, all of a sudden that 250 went uh, to 200. And so next, that $50,000 that of lost revenue probably maybe equates to somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in profit, bottom line. So all of a sudden that money's gone. And given that scenario, what decisions would you make based on that decreased revenue? And I think going through that exercise for the first time will give you at least an idea of what things you you should do. Uh, so the first thing is to kind of have a plan, do some what if scenarios, and then if necessary, execute on that plan. Yeah, that's great advice. Great advice, absolutely. So we have a question from Preeti. Uh, would you prefer credit unions or banks to suffice short-term cash load needs? Mm -hmm. Bill, that's a great one for you. So if, if I understand the question, is that as far as where they would deposit their money? Uh, I would think so, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, there are, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of excellent credit unions in Atlanta. Uh, my entire background is in banking. I spent uh, 32 years in banking before I launched my business. Uh, both have different types of insurance programs that impact uh, the safety of money. Uh, I don't have a strong opinion either way, but I do have a banking bias only because I spent so much of my career in banking. I see. Okay. Um, and, and there's another question I uh, from Preeti as well, I from Facebook. I have a vendor who is 20 years in business and just ignoring to pay back. The invoice is less than 6000 so legal action is not worth it. But during these times, is it is not something we can ignore? Can you suggest next steps for collection? That's a great question. Hmm. 
It's like the other side. Yeah, now. I think that gets back to uh, Tim's story that he was telling. He was very upfront with his vendor. So whoever owes uh, this $6,000, in my mind, uh, ought to pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I can't do this, but I can do this. Uh, anytime people go quiet, uh, that just disrupts the relationship. So, and if you're, if the money is owed you and the other person is call is not calling, then I would just say, Hey, call them and just say, look, uh, we're all going through this thing together. You know, your, uh, your receivables are, are my payables and, and vice versa. And so what can we do together, uh, that we can agree on? Uh, anytime I think you get legal action or attorneys involved, in my experience, is the only people that win in that scenario is the attorneys. But hopefully they can talk to each other and work something out, maybe do the invoice in pieces. If 6000 won't work, can 1500 a week for the next four weeks work? Or 1000 a week for the next six weeks? You know, something like that. And if I could add to that, one of the best lessons I ever got in collections was someone who that's all they did were collections. And what they suggested is when there's a collection issue, there are three possibilities. The first possibility is that they're what's referred to as a slow pay. Some people are just naturally slower to pay their bills than others. If you give them 30, they're going to pay in 35. So there are slow pays. There are problem pays. A problem pay is someone who's, who's not paid you because there's a problem. Maybe there was a problem with a service or product that you provided them. Maybe there's a problem because you didn't get a signature. Maybe there's a problem because you didn't provide a purchase order. Something is holding up payment. It's a problem pay. And the third possibility is what's referred to as a no pay. They did not intend to pay you prior to delivery of the service. They don't intend to pay you today. So that's really been helpful for me. When I've got a collection issue, the first thing that I do is I just ask myself, is this a slow pay? Is this a problem pay? Or is this a no pay? Because each of those then has different strategies that you could use that you could incorporate to try to get your cash. But it starts off with like a doctor diagnosing, okay, what, what kind of problem do I have here? So probably that's what I would recommend to our listeners. If you're having collection issues, start with, which of the three buckets does this issue fall into? Yeah, that's a great point, Tim. Yeah, that's gr that's great. I wish I, I knew about that before too. <laughs> I mean, how do you? Uh, but during this crisis, it, it was it a problem play or a no pay? <laughs> well, what's interesting is is oftentimes we we misdiagnose. We think something is a slow pay until we call them up and we find out, you know, we're missing a purchase order, we're missing something. And then now 30, 60 days have passed and what we thought was a slow pay is now a, a problem pay. Or we think something is a slow pay and it's a no pay. The quicker we can diagnose the no pay, the better off we are. Because what, what research shows is that once something gets out past 30 days, it gets harder and harder and harder to collect. So the quicker we can diagnose it, the better we'll off we'll be. Thank you for that. Hey, Bill, um, you mentioned about a scorecard. Can you remind us what categories we should be prioritizing on? Yeah, so the scorecard really is uh, has two components to it. First is the balance sheet. Uh, the balance sheet, really, I'm tracking uh, ca the cash balance. Second thing I'm tracking is receivables. And I'm looking at how many days worth of sales and cash do I have? So to quick math, just to kind of walk through the calculation, that might be helpful, is I'm going to take my revenue and I'm going to divide it by the number of days in a year. I use a 360 day year. And so I'm going to get how many, what is my average daily sales? Then I'm going to take that number and divide it into my cash balance. And that tells me basically how many days of sales I have in cash. And I'm tracking that on a monthly basis. I do the same thing with receivables. I take my daily sales and I divide that number into my accounts receivable balance. And that tells me how many days sales I have in receivables. The third thing I'm looking at on my balance sheet is my leverage. It's also called a debt to worth ratio. 
what's my total debt or my total liabilities, what's my net worth, and then what is the relationship. If I have $1 of debt to every $1 of net worth, my ratio is one to one. But the problem is if I'm borrowing on my line of credit to fund my business, then all of a sudden one to one becomes two to one, three to one, four to one, and so on, your leverage increases. And so those are the three things that I watch on the balance sheet. Switching over to the income statement, I'm really watching two things. I'm watching the gross profit margin, which is before overhead, and I'm watching the net profit margin, which is actually um, after overhead, not only looking at the numbers, but also looking at the margins. So one thing I will say in a downturn and actually any time, your balance sheet is actually more important to you as a business owner than the income statement. Your balance sheet tracks three things. It tracks your liquidity, how much cash you have, tracks your activity, how am I collecting my receivables, and what's my leverage, how much debt do I have in relation to my net worth. So three things out of the four. The income statement only tracks profitability. Well, profitability is a good me measure, but you can't spend profit. And so until it goes from receivables to cash, uh, you, can't, you can't spend it. Last time I checked, nobody's willing to take my accounts receivable as payment for a, for a bill that I owe. Yeah. <laughs> so what I do is I put all those in a scorecard and then I track them every month. So those are the, those are the elements that I have. I hope that wasn't too long of an explanation. No, it's a great explanation. Um, so in the past, we, you know, in the last, uh, in the first two episodes, we covered the SBA loan, disaster loan, and we covered the, the paycheck protection program, the PPP. Um, so what, first of all, they, what's your opinion on that? And, you know, and there's an example I'm applying, but I know it would take time to, to get, uh, to come in to get approved. And uh, while I'm waiting on the SBA loan, what can I do to stay afloat? You know, I, I mean, even for me, I'm going to rely on this, you know, on, on, on the funding to come through as well in order for us to stay afloat for the next two months being in the gig biggest industry. So I definitely can relate to that question, too. And Bill, if I may, you had shared with me before we started that you have already worked with over 30 clients in helping them apply for and, and acquire uh, this particular loan. So I'm, I'm as interested as our listeners to hear what you're experiencing so far and, and maybe any advice that you have for our listeners as well. Yeah. So I, I won't name the source, but uh, I read an article yesterday that, uh, and first let me say the, the PPP program is a great program, but this one author said, you know, this is like a 787 aircraft attempting to do a takeoff on a short landing strip. And by the way, all the bolts aren't totally, tight wings to the fuselage. So first of all, I commend the administration for understanding that uh, the, the economic impact to the small business community across the country is so significant that the administration took swift action and rolling it out. And I commend them for that. The challenge is you have, I believe the number is it's either 3 million or 30 million business owners uh, nationwide. Probably a majority of those do qualify for the PPP loan. And so I have heard numbers literally in the tens of thousands of local banks taking applications on a daily basis. There is one uh, bank here in Atlanta that has said, we've taken all the applications that we can take. And so I think what can you do in the meantime is first uh, hang in there uh, because uh, I do think banks are going to attempt to get these lo loans funded as quickly as possible, but there is some guidance that is required for the program to operate well, not only for the government, but also for the banks and for the small business owners. So what can you do in the meantime? Uh, this would be a time where you attempt to conserve cash like we had talked to earlier. If you can collect some of those receivables uh, that are out there, especially the ones that are beyond terms, that's a great strategy. Uh, talk to your vendors, people that you owe money to, and just say, 
hey, I'm trying to collect some of my receivables, just like you're trying to collect mine. I'm working as hard as I can to get this, but I might be, I might be a little later than what you or I would like to be. I just want to be sure that's okay. And then the other thing is now would also be a time to either ask your bank to increase your line of credit if you can, or if you don't have a line of credit, then go ahead and take that out. Great advice. Um, are there any case studies? This, this is this is uh, Craig from Facebook. Are there any case studies or examples on, on businesses that have received creative forms of rent relief? Creative forms on what again? Rent relief. Hmm. Oh, um, hmm. I haven't seen any case studies. Uh, I have talked probably in the past week to at least 15 or 20 business owners. And I would say at least 80 or 90% of them have successfully uh, negotiated uh, rent deferments for anywhere 90 days, up to 90 days. Um, you know, if you look at, so I, I want to say, I think this is either my third or fourth recession that I've been through. You know, your landlord wants to keep you as a tenant. You're their income stream. They're going to use your rent to basically run their property, pay their people. And if they have a mortgage, pay the mortgage holder. So they want your rent. Uh, if you can't pay it for a short period of time, they're going to look to you to say, well, what can you pay? This, again, gets back to that conversation between two people, whatever they can agree on. Uh, so I'm not aware of any case studies, but I have seen probably cases where 15 to 20 of my clients that I've talked to in the last two weeks, uh, I'm going to guess at least 80, 85 percent of them have said they successfully negotiated a deferment in their rent. So I hope that helps. That's, that's as good as any case study we could have had. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what sort of employees are considered top talent? Can you expand on that? Most companies are laying off people, not hiring, but I can see where having the right person in the right place is key. What talents would you suggest I look for besides the technical expertise for the job? That's a, that's a long one. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Tim, you want to take that or you want me to? I'll start with that, and, and, and Bill, you're welcome to, to, to follow, because that's a question I'm getting from a, a number of my clients is, as they're looking, you know, payroll is usually the, their their largest expense, fifty percent or more, and they're they're trying to make decisions based on what they believe will be a decline in revenue, decline in cash, what to do. And here's what I'm suggesting is is, and it's not a one size fits all, but but number one, you know, Qua, you may remember when you went through the Business Express program, we used the Welch grid to 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 evaluate talent. And the Welch grid, it came from Jack Welch when he was a GE, and it says essentially, we're gonna look at two things. We're gonna look at employees' performance, and we're gonna look at their behavior. Behavior is defined by alignment with our company values, uh, alignment with our culture, are they a, a fit? So we're looking at performance and behavior. If you, I believe that if you have an employee who is failing or, or even near failing in both of those, that's where I would start in terms of making employee cuts. The term that we use quite often, that's our, that's our dead wood. And I don't know of any small business in a good economy that can afford to, to keep dead wood, nevertheless, where we are today. The exception to that might be family members. <laughs> Sometimes I've dealt with family businesses and the dead wood might be a, a family member, but that aside, uh, now's the time to get rid of dead wood. That's step number one. Step number two, and this comes, comes from uh, Patrick Linsoni, who's one of my favorite authors, wrote a book called Five Dysfunctions of a Team, in addition to a number of other best-selling books. He just came out with uh, an article this past week, and he suggested the next step is to do what he referred to as a voluntary pay cut. This is essentially going to your employees and saying, okay, we're, we need to cut. This is where we are. Is there anyone who would like to volunteer to take a pay cut? And it may be that that pay cut would be then come back to them at some point as things got better. But we asked for volunteers first, and, and I'd never really thought of that before. But he suggested, not unusual, that a number of employees who can afford to take a pay cut will take a step forward and say, you know what, 
I can do that. John over here, not as good a position as me. I'm okay. I will volunteer for a pay cut. I'm willing to take a 5%, 10% voluntary pay cuts, step number two. And then step number three would then be uh, potentially across the board uh, pay cuts. That's what I'm seeing most companies kind of step by step, get rid of the dead wood, voluntary pay cuts, and then potentially involuntary, or just asking employees across the board to take 10, 15%. I, I find most companies and, and employees would rather do, do that than lose a key employee, which is, that's the other alternative for companies if they can't, can't achieve pay cuts. So those are just a few things that I'm seeing. Bill, what are you seeing on your side? So uh, one thing comes to mind, a great book that had an impact on me was a book by John Gordon. It's called The Energy Bus. Hmm. And each business owner uh, is responsible for the people that they let on their bus uh, because they're the driver. And the first thing is all of us have experienced interaction with people that no matter uh, when the conversation occurs, that person gives you energy. And those are the kind of people that you want to interact with. Uh, then uh, John uh, says, you know, and then there are those other people. Uh, he just says, you know, there's some energy vampires out there. <laughs> and those energy vampires literally just suck the life. I'm probably seeing heads nod in the uh, listening audience right now because you know uh, you've had that experience. So the other thing I would say is now would be a time to take a hard look uh, at the uh, energy vampires. And Tim also made a great point. You know, people, people hire on skills, but they fire based on behavior. And so uh, those would be the two things that I would add there. Mm. Thank you so much. That's really good. So I got two more questions. So um, is the balance sheet the best way to help tenant best, uh, businesses sub substantiate their reduced ability to pay rent? Are there any better, quicker ways to communicate this diminished capacity? I'm wary of clients triggering imminent economic default. Good question. Go yeah. So if I'm if I'm understanding the question, um, is there a alternative way besides using a balance sheet? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in this case, uh, if a person's having cash flow issues, um, I think the best determining uh, financial statement you have is actually your cash flow statement, which we didn't talk about. Uh, but essentially, um, the cash flow statement basically shows uh, obviously the changes in your cash balance and where that went. Uh, generally, if I'm going to show somebody that I'm having cash flow issues, I'm not going to use the balance sheet, I'm going to use the cash flow statement. Because really what the cash flow statement does is it takes the total amount of cash that has come from sales that you've paid out either in cost of goods or cost of sales, your operating expenses. If you've borrowed money, that's an inflow of cash. And it basically comes up with your net changes in cash over time. Also, if the owner's pulling out distributions, uh, then that's also a, a, a cash outflow which impacts cash flow negatively. So I would actually use the cash flow statement rather than use the balance sheet. Tim, any thoughts for you? I, I, I completely agree. I think it starts with the cash flow statement. Yep. And by the way, the cash flow statement is number two on my list behind the balance sheet. Income statement for me is actually third. Yep. Um, so this brings me to the last point, which is financial literacy. So it's, <laughs> uh, I'm a victim of it as well. It took me years to get to a, an am to an amateur place, you know, and not the knowledge that you guys have. But so, I think I think in this type of crisis, uh, it's so important that people start getting stuff even more educated uh, and understanding how to read the balance sheet and how to read a cash flow statement. And I, I know there's a lot of tools out there, uh, but some of them are kind of just. You know, you look at the numbers, it might be black. It's just like, what does this actually mean? So where do they go and get that knowledge so they can make that determine, make better decisions? Because obviously you could probably take a glance at it and you know exactly what's happening <laughs> with the company, you know? But someone, even like myself, I could look at it. I'm like, what am I looking at? Yeah, Tim, you want to start on that one? I did a couple things come to mind. 
One is, this is a great time to sit down with your accountant, your CPA, who normally gives you your financial statements. You kind of nod at them and then you go back to your normal work. Now's the time to sit down and really go in depth with your CPA through your financials so that you understand those numbers. So when you do go to the bank or you go to your, your landlord and they ask questions about your financials, you're able to answer those questions. So number one, start with your CPA. Another great resource is through the SBA, the Small Business Administration, are the Small Business Development Centers. There are offices in every metropolitan area in the country. They are all over the country. They provide free consulting to small businesses. And I know just here in the Atlanta area, we have about a dozen different uh, SBDC offices. And these consultants will, again, sit down with you and walk you through your financials. They also do workshops for small business owners to help them uh, understand and, and read their financial statements. And then the third thing that comes to mind, the book that I've relied upon uh, quite a bit, quite, is a book called Financial Intelligence. And I can't remember the two authors' names, two authors. The book is called Financial Intelligence. It's probably the best book that I've ever seen for non-financial people to understand their, their financials, financial intelligence. Bill, what, what suggestions do you have? Yeah, along those same lines. So here's, here's the big challenge. Um, generally, when you start a business, uh, you are a great technician, uh, but no one taught you in school how to run a business. And there's no on the job training when you're the CEO because you know everybody expects you to know everything. So uh, I think Tim has pointed out some great resources. Uh, one of the other things, I have found that it is very hard to have a relationship with a banker. Uh, eight out of 10 business owners that I talk to have a bank, but not a banker. And so, but if you can find a good banker, in addition to your CPA, your CPA is going to give you all of the accounting of your numbers and they will give you some financial insight, but bankers, really look more at the finance side of the business. And really there's two components. There's the accounting side, which is the numbers and getting them in the reports. And then the other thing is interpreting those reports, which is really the, the finance piece. So good resources in addition to what Tim mentioned, I would say if you can find a good banker, mm -hmm. hold on to that person. And then just like uh, anything else, so uh, when I wanted to lose weight, uh, I went to a weight loss coach. If you want to find financial literacy and you can find someone to help you uh, uh, coach you in that, then by all means do that. Well, you guys are coaches. <laughs> so uh, just make sure. So those who are looking for a coach, those are great advice that they have. But I, I'm sure that the, the website is all listed on the uh, on the side panel. Uh, you could check out Tim. I'm sure anyone, you you know, they you'll be okay them reaching out to you, right? They need you, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Happy to help. And, uh, and same with you, Bill, right? And so, Absolutely. Um, so they're there for a reason, and uh, obviously they're a wealth of knowledge. So, Bill and Tim, we're going to close out. Let me know what is it, uh, any last things that you want to say and before we close? Mm -hmm. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, I would just say, first of all, uh, if, this is your, uh, if this is your first recession, uh, first, it's a, it's a big club. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, take a breath. Uh, don't allow your um, don't allow what you're seeing uh, on the negative side to outweigh what you're seeing on the positive side. So I, I did a podcast uh, recently, and the interviewer asked me, and and what I was seeing in my own personal life was seeing the case case number rise, the deaths rise. I wasn't seeing the positive things like uh, manufacturing concerns, actually changing their operations to make uh, hand sanitizer, uh, manufacturers that were actually making ventilators, uh, seeing a business uh, donate 2 million masks to FEMA. And so I just want to encourage you first uh, to maintain a mindset that is uh, open to seeing both the positive with the negative uh, and then the other thing is leverage your resources. We're going to get through this together. Uh, that means relying heavily on your professional advisors, your CPA, 
your banker, other trusted advisors that you've cultivated, uh, and draw on their draw on their expertise. Tim, what about yeah. you? Those are great, Bill. And three things come to mind for me. Number one, cash is king. Uh, if, if a small business runs out of cash, no matter how good a product, how good a people, how good your marketing program is, if you run out of cash, it's, it's game over. Second, as, as we talked about, is I want each of our listeners to be a, a buyer when we come out of this, this uh, disaster. So I want you to not only have cash, I want you to accumulate cash so that you can take advantage of the upside uh, in, in, in this economy. Um, and, and third, and, and Bill, you made a great point of this, is sometimes in terms of managing cash, the gold is in the smaller numbers and not always the bigger numbers. You know, usually the first thing we look at is payroll and we're going to cut 10 people. But if we start looking at some of the smaller expenses, things that we don't normally look at, you may find some good opportunities there to, to better manage your cash. And if I could, a fourth is, is ask for help. You don't have to go through this solo. Uh, there's lots of good help uh, surrounded you and your business. Find help. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Bill and Tim. And uh, that was a, a lot. I mean, the Q&A session was amazing. <laughs> thank you so much. So with that, everybody, uh, we're going to close out over here. Um, so I want to first thank the Chamber, U.S. Pan Asian American Chamber of Commerce over here that allowing us to put, uh, uh, put this uh, platform together and as well as uh, to be able to communicate to, to the audience out there that's going to, I know this, this uh, if you're watching, this, is gonna, that sh this should help you. And if you, are, uh, and if you know somebody or you, that, that, that you think it could help, make sure you share it. This is not, you know, Channel 11 over here. It's, 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 uh, it's social media. Share it. Share it to the people that you don't even know because they could actually use it. And we're all in it together. Businesses rely on other businesses as well. And, uh, and, and it, the more help we can get from sharing knowledge, then it, the better we can make better decisions and also pivot ourselves. So with that, uh, we do a show every, every week. Um, and it's, it's uh, um, sometimes we do it on the fly, breaking news. But next Monday, uh, we are going live again. Um, don't have the topic of the show, but we'll figure it out this week. <laughs> so be sure you subscribe at youtube.com slash kvibetv. Uh, go to Facebook and make sure you hit the like button. Uh, follow these two gentlemen out there, Bill and Tim, and, and uh, reach them out to any questions that they have. And with that, uh, thank you, everybody. Stay safe. And... Take care. There's still a stark reality the nation faces. More serious illness and death and a health system at breaking point. It's scary for everyone. We will get out of this. People are going to have to step up to help each other. These are such unprecedented times and it really should draw out that sense of creativity. Physically distanced and socially connect. These days are what the internet was built for. We can spread love, we can spread ideas, we can spread relationship, we can spread thought without spreading a dangerous bug. Get ahead of it and let's figure this out together.